I'm going to put this out to all of you. Um, what is one of your most memorable moments on social media where uh, either good or bad, where you had a great interaction or uh, maybe everything went to hell? Mo, because I know you've had multiple of these. We'll start with you. Um, well, maybe the most memorable was when uh, – when UC lost to Connecticut last year in the AAC tournament, I tweeted, F <laughs> <laughs> Again, excuse the language. In a total moment of candor. <laughs> and that caused both the Reds and Bengals to unfollow me. So, uh, so, so I learned I probably shouldn't tweet after a, a Connecticut player doesn't get called for goaltending. Um, my favorite thing on Twitter is uh, – a few years ago, the Reds decided to start selling funnel fries <laughs> at Great American Ballpark. And I was explaining to somebody, I had to write a blog the next day about a game I had gone to. And I mean, it was like a very nondescript five nothing game. It wasn't, so I, I like, couldn't think of anything remotely interesting about the game itself or really funny. And to be honest with you, I really didn't pay that close attention to what was happening on the field, but I did have some of these funnel fries. So I wrote a blog about funnel fries. And then I decided that I was going to prove to someone that I could sell funnel fries. Via, I could become the funnel fry guy on social media. So I spent the next couple of months just tweeting nonstop about how much I love these funnel fries. I mean, the reality is I, I had them maybe twice. But for like two years, every time I would look at my mentions during baseball season or during a Reds game, it would be, hey, where are the funnel fries? Uh, behind section 128 and 129, right behind Penn Station. It's, I, so I tried to prove that I could brand myself as something. And, you know, if you brand yourself as something, what better thing to be wrapped around than funnel fries? Yeah. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to prove the power of – I never talked about them on the air. I never made them a part of the radio show. It was social media only, and I wrote one blog about them. And I think it kind of I, – I did it to sort of show somebody, you know, the – how social media can help shape how people feel about you, and it could sell product. Now, the Reds have never given me a dime from their funnel fry sales, <laughs> um, but that and the F-bomb after the UConn game last year, I think are my two biggest moments on, on Twitter, I think. I know, I, know, I know you pretty well, yeah. and I remember specifically coming up to you asking you where the funnel fries were at this, one point. Yeah. Like, we hang out at games all the time, and yeah. then all of a sudden I said, you know what, I want to have those funnel fries. You love those. A couple uh, years ago. I didn't realize it was all a scam. A couple years ago. Well, it's not a scam. They're good. But, I mean, you know, I mean, there's only so much you can do with funnel They moved them a couple of years ago. They moved them to the upper deck of the stadium. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it was opening day, and I just happened to look at my phone. There were, like, 94 mentions, like, where are the funnel fries? What happened to them? Are they off the menu? Like, I, you know, I don't know. I, I kind of I got off that kick a couple of years ago. So, yeah. yeah. Jamie, you got a few things to follow up with the Reds to <laughs> clean up Mo's let's, mess. Well, let's just get this out of the way, because I know this, pro this question was probably, you know, tailor-made for me. So, for those that, you, uh, that may follow me on Twitter for a long time, um, you know, I'm pretty passionate about my employer. You know, I believe it or not, I'm, I don't always agree with what we do, but I'll be damned if I'm not going to be the most loyal soldier in the platoon. Uh, and to, um, you know, pardon me for doing the military metaphors, but I'm on the front lines as far as the fan interaction goes with the uh, with Twitter. And um, so I, I, you know, I'm very loyal to my team and. I think that's important, and I think that's what a lot of Reds fans um, are attracted to as far as why they follow me. Um, my early years on Twitter, um, this kind of, I let it, my emotions show a lot, probably, or definitely more so than I should. And um, the Reds were in the middle of a five-game losing streak uh, in a year in which they won over 90 games in which they would go to the playoffs and come within one game from going to the National League Championship Series. So in my mind, a five-game losing streak is what all good teams go through. And it, that's the truth. If you go back and look through some of the good teams in recent memory, they'll have bumps in the road. So I felt it was my duty to calm everyone down because we were getting a lot of people who were, you know, incited by, you know, the fact that we were losing five straight games that we have just blown the season. This was probably in June. So um, 
I'm sure Mo got a lot of calls that week. So, you know, I'm kind of like, look, it's a five-game losing streak. I was explaining on Twitter. I was talking people off the ledge. And there was one guy who was tr trolling me, and I, you know, I'm assuming that you all, if you're here, you know what a troll is. So every time I would tweet something positive, he would tweet something very negative involving the people who I, were in, who I was interacting with um, to the point he was using profanity, he was using some homophobic language. So I sent him a direct message and I said, I would love to kick your ass in front of your six followers. <laughs> I think less, within less than 10 minutes, it was on Deadspin. He had sent the screenshot to Deadspin. And next thing I know, WLWT has a um, story up. It says, Red's employee in hot water for his tweets. So I think my wife and I, who's over there, I, I told her, I said, this is my last day on the job. I think I'm gonna be fired tomorrow. So I braced myself, she's in tears. I'm worried sick, I didn't sleep at all that night. Like, what are you, you're gonna let this guy take your job from you? But it kinda, you know, I think because of my loyalty and my passion, I think the Reds kind of um, said, well, okay, next time you're out of here, but we appreciate you sticking up for us, whatever. And it kinda was just kinda swept under the rug and I put an apology out on my blog, which my boss said I shouldn't have done that because it would have drawn more attention to it, but I felt it was important. But yeah, everything kind of went back to normal after that. I only got one follow-up on that one. You, you said your wife was in tears the night before, laughing? Yeah, she was like, she was like, yeah, who are you going to beat up? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, question. So as, as in-house guys, uh, you, Tommy and Jamie, how often do you find yourself starting to tweet something and then you back off and you're like, ah, better not do that? It's often. Often. I, it's usually after my second glass of wine and I think, Whoa, back off. Or she'll see something that I'm about to tweet and she'll be like, nah, take it easy. So, I, I, I tend to have a grandma rule in, in regards to everything and, and this has to do with maybe tweeting words that are four letters and start with F <laughs> after a basketball game. But if grandma wouldn't be happy with the tweet, um, if she could read it, then you probably shouldn't tweet it. So that, that tends to be my rule. But uh, from being an internal person, uh, you all might remember <coughs> 2009, we had a really good football season, uh, went 12-0. and And that got a lot of attention from a university in South Bend for our head football coach. And there was rumors going on all week long. And he was in New York City and started tweeting some odd things. And uh, I stopped by the football office and uh, they told me his account was was hacked. <clears throat> he wasn't really tweeting that stuff. I mean, this was still pretty early years of Twitter. And uh, so what did I tweet? I said, all right, hey, everybody, you know, that's not Brian Kelly. His, his account's been, been hacked. And then, like, two hours later, I got called up into my boss's office. And Jeremy was with Athletics then, so he can imagine how that went. Um, and I was told my career was over. That I, NBC Sports had written an article saying Tom Glitter from UC <laughs> Athletics has confirmed that Brian Kelly's account is hacked, blah, 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 blah. I'm picking up hundreds of followers because all these Notre Dame fans are now following me. And uh, lo and behold, I walk into the football office, and the person who told me it was hacked is laughing. And I'm like, what's so funny? She's like, I was just joking. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm about to get fired. And you just were joking? So then I had a tweet. Now NBC Sports updates their story. I get called back up to the boss's office. He's like, really? Like, you know that you just ruined your entire career. Fortunately, I found a way to bounce back. I didn't get, <laughs> I didn't get fired. We all have moments like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's because Jeremy doesn't have any friends that are females. Besides <laughs> <laughs> I know Lisa is um, an awesome social media digital person for the Red. What about like, other women who work in your organizations? How can they rise up to your type of Jamie, you work with Lisa, and obviously. Yeah, actually, Lisa there. would have been here, except I had a much cooler direct message story than she did. <laughs> <laughs> no, she her, she broke her foot. Actually, she would have been here, but she broke her foot. Um, that's a great question, and that's one that's very important to me. Actually, um, I, I think it's just uh, you know, look, it was touched upon in the Oscars about 
there is a huge, and without trying to get too political here, there's a huge gap between what women earn in this country and the success they get compared to you know, men. It's, un, it's unfair. With that being said, I think they, unfortunately, women have to, I gotta be careful here, they have to um, maybe work a little harder. And that's, I'm, I hate saying that. I think it's unfortunate. I think it's the same with, uh, with minorities too. And I think that it, it's tougher for them, but they, they have to take advantage of probably more so of the, uh, the connections that they have, the networking that they have, and just you know anything that pops up especially in this day and age with social media, be aggressive in pursuing it. And I think we are, the Reds are a great company for diver, like our th main thing right, is diversity. It's get as many different faces in here as possible and different genders. And I think it's just a matter of pursuing it more aggressively. I, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, coming from the NFL world, I mean, there's tons of different, uh, it's insane the amount of credentials that you have for an event. Like there are over a thousand people at the combine this past weekend. And the one thing that social media, which is good to bring it up in this area, offers is I think it puts everybody on an even playing field more so than anything else because everyone is just you are your product. You are whatever you put out. You are your, you know, your your how interesting you are. How many people want to follow you? How important the information is. I mean, you can. And if you gain followers, if you can be an interesting person that people want to follow for reasons of your job or whatever, people will. And it's the masses will sort of speak because if you are applying for a job and you have worked up where you've become an interesting social media follow, employers are going to want to hire you for that. I mean, people build their brand for that reason. You build your brand and you can get jobs anywhere and rise up anywhere because people, trust me, will pay a lot of money for that these days. I mean, that's one of the top things that people, particularly in our industry, in the newspaper industry, are, are looking for, our brands, big names. It makes it make you be able to connect with everyone. So, and I think that's the one thing that Twitter and social media can kind of can kind of bring is you just, you just build your brand, whatever you are, and, and followers will follow. I, I, th I think we're all really familiar with the darker side of Twitter, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's multifaceted, it's anonymity, it's nastiness, it's meanness, you know, I mean, we all see it. And first of all, your sentiments about Lisa, I mean, she basically invented social media, Major League Baseball. I mean, it, there's no bigger fan of, of her than, than me, so I, I'm with you. But I work with a woman uh, named Lindsay, Lindsay Patterson, who has produced my show for about five years, and she's about to start working in television in Dayton and uh, works, for, works with Paul at Cincinnati.com. She does a little bit of everything, and <clears throat> you know, I, she's more active on Twitter than I am. Now, her Twitter interaction, I mean, she, she, she'll tweet you what she's having for breakfast. <laughs> I have very little interest in telling you what I had for breakfast. But she's on Twitter that much, and because she's involved in sports and because most of her followers are male and because there's such a, a nasty element to Twitter, I think, unfortunately, whether you're Lindsay on a smaller scale or somebody like a Katie Nolan who works at Fox Sports or, you know, um, Lindsay Zarniak who works at SportsCenter or something, they're really exposed, I think, to the real nasty elements. I mean, she, I've seen Lindsay's mentions and... She could tweet a really astute observation about the Bengals, and ultimately, she's told to go back into the kitchen. Or, you know, she'll get messages from guys, and I mean, she she once tweeted after a Bengals game. They they played an exhibition game at night, and she tweeted, "I'm about to go walk back to my car by myself at Longworth Hall." And I called her on her phone, and I said, "Are you out of your mind?" I said, "Do you read your mentions? You have creepy dude after creepy dude, and he just told him, "Hey, here's where you can come kidnap me." Um, I don't have that, and Paul doesn't have that, and Kevin and Jamie and Tommy don't have that. And I think, unfortunately, there's in, in sports in particular, I can't speak to news or you know other realms, but in sports in particular, you're just subjected to that, and I'm not, and these guys aren't. And, and I think that's really unfortunate, but I think the ones who can cut through that and overcome that are the ones who are going to succeed, not just in the social media realm, but in, in sports. This is still a... Not, not as much as it was 10, 15 years ago, but it's still a male-dominated realm. Lindsay's the only woman working in programming at my radio station. Um, 
I would imagine Lisa is one of the few, you know, women working in social, directing social media in Major League Baseball. There's not as many, you know, beat writers who are, are women. And those who are, they're just subjected to stuff that the rest of us aren't. And I'm sure it causes some of them to fold, and I'm sure many of them rise above it. And those who rise above it are going to have a, a lot of success. If I can add to that, um, a lot of, I'll tell you what, honestly, I have a lot of female followers who are huge Reds fans. And to be honest and to be frank, I get more pleasure out of interacting with them from a Reds point of view because quite frankly, they're smarter. They have, they have better points and, you know, especially there's a certain group that I'm very familiar with who they know more about the Reds than probably I do, you know, and they're, and they're avid fans. They follow everybody on Instagram. They follow everybody on Twitter. And I enjoy that interaction more because not just because they're women, but because they have something to bring to the table. They have some substance rather than you guys suck or, you know, great game or something like that, which that's fine too. But I, I think not to, there, you, I think it would be uh, wrong to underestimate the female presence on Twitter as far as sports goes. I, and I, gr I agree with everything that Mo said about it's a male driven, it, op I, that's a, of course, obviously it is, but don't underestimate that female presence. And I, I agree with Jamie that, that the female followers that I have too tend to be a lot more even keel and reasonable after a bad loss for the Bearcats or something along those lines. Mo brought up the nasty side of Twitter and, and, and obviously uh, some of the points there. And I'm sure that, that Kevin sees some of that ugliness on Twitter. I mean, you're fortunate, Kevin, that you just played in a Pro Bowl. You're a very good punter. You don't have a lot of bad days out there, but the Bengals have bad days. And there have been days when you haven't had a great game. Do you just have to shut it down at that point? Or, and I mean, have you learned just to not look and, and not take it personally? Yeah, I mean, I, I still look because I think it's funny sometimes. You know, the people that come out and they, they give their two cents about, you know, what they think you should do or what, how bad you are, you know, I don't mind looking at it because, I mean, I know I had a bad game if I had a bad game. It's, you can tell me all you want, but I still know I had a bad game. You know, I, I'm not going to get more rod ups because you told me so. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of guys, there's guys on the team that they'll see that and, you know, it affects them differently. So, you know, it's, uh, sorry, everybody's calling me right now apparently. And I get like a text a day, so. Um, but yeah, so it's I don't mind looking at it. Um, you know, I just kind of I like to brush it off. But there are guys I know that it affects them, and you know they 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 haven't been had the ability to just brush it off. They they read it and they, you know, you, you can tell it affects them, and it they they put more pressure on themselves to perform better, and sometimes that actually snowballs in the opposite direction. Um, you know, but I guess fortunately for myself, I've for whatever reason, been able to just, you know, laugh about it and, you know, retweet some stuff and, you know, just kind of go along with it. Do you, feel, do you feel like it's uh, – I'll give you one second. Well, I was going to say, you know, your area was really affected. And I wrote a story about guys and Bengals players and what they do after games and dealing with social media after, I, after Mike Nugent had a, had a game where he missed a, a possible game-winning field goal against Carolina this year. And he, what happened on his mentions was just – disgusting and and he dealt with it so well I mean he backed away from it and he kind of was able to make a joke about it and that's I mean you've done you did a great job of that as well and that's something that's really important players handling it is a challenge because there's you guys are competitive and, and they you know you want to get out there and, and tell them what's right and, and players really have a hard time sometimes dealing with that they, they you know you, you're coming off the emotions of a game and so many now you know I, I'd say the majority of players that I talked to said after a game the first thing they do once they get a shower and get cleaned up is go on their Twitter and look at what's going on and you want to if people are being you know in any situation going after you want to go back at them and you know you have to understand that you know they they understand now more than ever they have to block that type of stuff out and I thought somebody like Mike and Andy deals with that a lot on his Twitter account of people just constantly just ugliness and you have to be able to poke fun at it and not let it get to you it's, and it's a new a new huge element of being a professional athlete now is dealing with that because it's constantly people trying to take you down and, and challenge you in that way and for like you guys it's you know it might be easy for you guys to just sit at home and Follow the guys that, okay, they had a bad game. Let me follow them. Let me see what they're going to say now. 
Because mm-hmm. most times guys are going to come out and they're going to say something stupid. Yeah. That, that is part of our job now is we have to, after the game, monitor what all the players are saying and see if somebody goes off on Twitter because then it becomes a story that we have to yeah. talk about. And I'm sure right away it's gonna, they're going to say something within mm-hmm. 30 minutes of the game and the next day you're going to be asking questions about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, it makes your guy's job easier. So <laughs> you sit back and just be like, oh. the way The way to handle it, and I was actually trying to pull out the tweet because it's one of my favorites and – I don't have service, Jeremy, but that's okay. The way to handle it is the way Brandon Phillips does. So one of my favorite tweets of all time, he went 0 for 4 one night, and you know he tweeted about whatever he was going to do after the game. And somebody wrote, why don't you go hit the batting cages, Mr. 0 for 4? And he goes, well, I'm going to get down with your girl, so call me Mr. 1 for 5. <laughs> that's perfect. That's, I mean, that's one of the greatest tweets of all. That's what, that is the way to handle it. Uh, Jamie probably didn't like that, the Reds, I'm, but I thought that I'm was gonna like... I'm going to openly disagree with Mo on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's still one of my... That might have been the first tweet I ever favored. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not so much the NFL, it's really the Bengals. And, and if you say something you shouldn't, they're either going to call you up to the office or they're going to put it on a big screen like this in the team meeting. And they're going to make light of it and uh, almost make an example of you, make fun of you, whatever it is, whatever needs to be done to, you know, let you know that it was the wrong thing to do. <clears throat> yeah, I saw that. And, you know. You know, Adam is, you know, I love Adam. He's a great guy. And I'm, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, we've kind of grown pretty close and pretty good friendship. Um, but, you know, Adam, you know, he can hold his own. You know, he knows what he's going to put out, and he's, he can hold his own for whatever flack might come his way. Um, so if he thinks that's what he needs to do, he's, he's going to do it. And he'll back it up, and he'll, you know, give you reasons why. And, you know, and... You know, I'm, I respect him for that, and you know, would I have done the same way? Probably not, just because I'm quieter, I'm more reserved. But that's how he wants to deal with it. You know, I'm, let him deal with it that way. Oh, I know you talked about that a little on your show. How do you make that determination? What actually is something worth talking about and calling, worth writing about, and what is just <coughs> well. You know, sometimes if you if you read it from a what you consider a credible source, you know, it's worth mentioning. And, and you got to be careful because, you know, especially with somebody like Adam, when they hear that name, that people are going to come to conclusions, or they're going to think you're coming to conclusions. When you see that the police were at least involved, you know that that tells you that this is at least worth passing on. And and with that story, you know, it came out. I think it came out right before we went on the air, and all, all you know in that in that case, all you're trying to do is is present. Here's what we know. Here's what's being said. Um, try not to draw any conclusions. You know, as I said that day, I go, well, you know, look, it, it happened in a casino, and it, it's not going to be hard to figure out what happened. There's there's cameras everywhere, you know. Um, so it was like the Ray Rice thing, not quite that serious, but it, it happened in a casino. It's on tape, you know. Now, if the NFL doesn't try to find it, that's one thing. But I, I, with the Adam Jones thing, you know, all you can really do is here's what's being said. Here's what's being said by people whose credibility I trust. Um, and, you, you know, you always allow, especially in cases like that, you always allow for, you know, more facts coming out. Let's not jump to conclusions. Really? It, it, yeah. That's how it works these that's, days? That's how, it's, <laughs> that's how it works for us. Um, some people don't operate that way, you know. Some people, <laughs> people, some people just don't operate that. You know, one of my favorites was a couple of years ago. Andre Smith got arrested for having a gun at an airport, and Andre Smith isn't really the most popular Bengal, um, you know, just because of the way he arrived in Cincinnati and held out and was kind of out of shape. But anyway, he got he had a gun in a bag, and people were making it out to sound like you know he he was Al Al Qaeda 2.0. I mean, you know. And, and I remember, like, you know, listening to people just hammer the guy, and I went, you know, should he have done it? No. But do we really think Andre Smith was going to hold up an airplane in mid-flight? I mean, chances are no. Like, he maybe didn't know the rules or maybe, didn't, you know, like, 
And it ended up being a relatively, if I recall, a relatively benign thing. It wasn't that big of a deal, but people just, it depends on the person's reputation and, or whether the, the public at large likes somebody. Um, if it was somebody with a higher Q rating publicly, then you know, we're a little bit more willing to give them leeway. And if it's somebody we just don't like, you know, we, we, uh, we jump to conclusions. And I think all of us kind of have a responsibility to not do that and encourage our audiences to, uh, to not do that, sometimes successfully and, and sometimes, unfortunately, unsuccessfully. To, to piggyback on the Adam Jones thing you were talking about, that was a really tough one from our perspective because it came out on TMZ, and it's a new thing that a lot of people are trying to figure out as well, how you deal with TMZ reporting things. And what, But once once there was a police report, we sort of had to touch on it. And the interesting thing that, ha I, I, you know, we with Adam has been involved in a lot around here, and some of it real, some of it he was picked on. And so you always have to be, particularly with him, always because he's just a passionate guy that tends to be in the news and so it, but what happened at that point was it went from being about what happened at the casino to being about his Instagram posts and and it because he came out with this profanity laden this isn't story blah 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 all that stuff that it, if you were following it, you saw and, and so now it it's like we have to update it every time he, okay, now he said this, and now he came out with an apology for saying this on Instagram, and then there's an apology uh, tweet, and it's like at a certain point, you, you, it's hard to find where to just let it go because it's just some guy. He's, he, he didn't do anything illegal, and he's just a guy being crazy on Twitter, which is not illegal. It's actually fairly regular, and uh, <laughs> so, you know, you, it's it's hard. It is it is a challenging thing to find where that fine line is, where the story ends, and where it just becomes a, a weird follow. As someone on the other side who works inside w with the organization, about a actually a year ago, um, I was in the manager's office with our general manager and one of our star players uh, regarding the content that was going on his Instagram account. And we, in so many words, told him to knock it off, and here's why. And so we had to explain to him. So we're not, you know, above, and I'm sure Kevin, like he's, he talked about, the, it's a Bengals thing, too. It's, it's a Reds thing. And the, 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 you have to protect your brand, whether it's your, your, one of your star players putting stuff up that you don't want your fans to see. You have to protect that. You have to protect them, too, because they might be naive, naive to it. So we had that discussion, and we're not scared to talk to our players or get after them a little bit about what they're doing. And Kevin, for you, I'd imagine too, uh, a lot of your teammates, I don't know if this has ever come up with you, with your agent or anybody that works with your agency, that they they want to make, I'm sure they're following you and, and keep a track too to make sure you're not putting out pictures with, uh, you know, that shouldn't be there, alcohol or, or whatever it might be at 3, 4 in the morning, they probably don't want you posting to your, uh, to your social media. Accounts. Right, and I, and I know, you know, my agents tell me stories how they've, you know, text, I see it, they text them right away. Hey, take it down. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of people that are looking out for us, I guess you could say, and, you know, looking out for us and looking out for themselves. So being the Bengals, they don't want to, you know, represent someone that, you know, is an idiot. Um, so they're going to do their job. They're paying us the money, so they're going to tell us what to do. And, you know, it's our job to listen. And, you know, if we don't listen and we do our own way, then they're going to get rid of us. So... You know, for, for some guys, they don't understand that, and that's why a lot of times they lose their jobs. Um, you know, but if you do what you're told and, you know, if they say take it down, you probably should take it down. There's probably a reason for them saying that. So, you know, it's, it happens all the time. Guys put up stuff they shouldn't put up, and, you know, they're told right away, probably within a, a business day, hey, you better take it down. So. As long as you're not sending a direct message starting to beat somebody Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got that out of the way just so we could get it out of the way, right? Uh, circle back around a little bit. Um, when, when, you, when you talk about partnerships, and, and I think we all deal with it in different ways, um, I, I know on my end with the university, you know, we're a Pepsi school. Um, we have a lot of corporate partners with the athletics department. Um, you know, Kevin's involved in, in some different corporate partnerships, I'm sure. You, you all have to think, I mean, we watch commercials, and – uh, I know Mo's had this issue both on the radio show and with social media, that if you trash a place, uh, <laughs> the guys down the hall in the sales office might call you and say, hey, you know that they're commercial plays during your show. Yeah, so you have to be cognizant, I imagine, all, all of you, on, on when you tweet stuff that you're not 
ticking off one of your uh, sponsors? Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Every salesperson I work with follows me. Um, you, you know, we our, our job at a radio station is to uh, sell commercials and play them. I mean, that's really what why we exist. Uh, and so anything that jeopardizes our ability to do that, you know, that's that's how I'll get in trouble. I mean, I, I've. I've been called into my office about into the boss's office for stuff I tweeted twice. Once was because I created a Twitter firestorm over microwavable pancakes. <laughs> I, I mean, literally, that. like people got mad at me. I tweeted you, one. No, no, I was you, at said, the you said that Pete. That I was at the grocery were store. Bad parents if they're if they're yeah. serving their kids. I was at the grocery pancakes. store. I passed the microwavable pancake aisle. I thought to myself, if you make those for your kid, you're a bad parent. And then I thought to myself, let's tweet, tweet that. that. <laughs> And then I looked and at my. And you hit send. And then I hit send, and really didn't think about it when I bought my grocery shopping. And then I went home, <laughs> and uh, my cousin called me. He's like, "Dude, like, what are you doing? Like, what are you like, what, what? And I'm putting my groceries away? Like, you created this like mini firestorm. Like, well, how did I do that? Like, the microwavable pancakes comment. And it got to the point like my boss really doesn't understand Twitter, but he's you know, he's like, what? Who did you make mad? I'm like, microwavable pancake. Eaters? I don't know. So. But I, I also kind of criticized one of our sponsors and really wasn't aware that it was one of our sponsors. Um, the, the Reds were going through a particularly bad stretch in 2011. And uh, one of the things that's happened with Twitter's explosion is the amount of scrutiny that the starting lineup gets. Jamie can speak to this more than anybody on a day in and day out basis. I mean, it wasn't this way 15 years ago. It was kind of like, all right, here's the nine guys who are going to play. Here, here's where they're going to hit. Now, I mean, at 3.30, 4 o'clock every day, when that lineup comes out, Cincinnati Twitter stops, and we're talking about who's hitting sixth. So I made the point on Twitter one day, the Reds were going through a particularly bad stretch, and I said, look, it's kind of like going to Golden Corral. You can eat the dessert first and the entree last and the dessert in the middle. It's still a bad meal. <laughs> you can take a bunch of bad players and hit them wherever you want. It's still a bad lineup. Corral is owned by Frisch's. Frisch's is our second biggest sponsor. The woman who runs Frisch's saw it and went to my boss and is like, so then I had to deal with two days of, well, how are you going to make this right? Kind of like Jamie alluded to. It's, it's like, well, if I bring it up, it kind of brings attention to the fact that, you know, Golden Corral kind of sucks. So, like, well, they want you to say something. So they... I'm like, I'm not going to lie and say, oh, I really love Golden Corral because that's not authentic and, and nobody's, nobody's going to believe that. So they wrote this thing for me to say and I had to, you know, talk about what a great, you know, corporate partner, corporate citizen the Frisch's company is and Golden Corral hires so many people in the area. But since then, if I make a reference to that, whether it's on or off air, I, I always try to think, all right. Do they are they one of our partners? Are they one of our potential partners? Are they a sponsor? Are is this going to get me in trouble down the hall? And uh, so I tr really try to 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 avoid analogies like that one. <laughs> Microwavable pancakes, by the way, are awful. I mean, if you're a parent and and you have time, make your kids real pancakes. And that was my only point. Jeez, I still I get tweets about that. I have two children. They get real pancakes. So <laughs> they don't do microwavable pancakes. Good question. Go ahead. Given all of the negative potential that social media will occur, you know, you can stop firing from the city calling office, and you're, you know, you're all the bad things in your high school. Is there anything with social media a want to get to, or is it all a have to top of your I just want to get retweets, so that's, <laughs> that's the only reason I'm involved. <laughs> our, our, my job is basically to create addiction. I know that sounds weird, but I want people to be addicted to the Reds. And if I can do that with my personality, my tweets, along with the tie-in to our product, then I feel like I'm doing a good job. Start them early. This, the first one's free, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, we want to create addiction and we want people to pay us, basically. Give us, give us their money and support. It, so it, to me, it's, yeah, I, I, want, I enjoy it. And that's, I volunteered to do this, so. I mean, I, I think from, particularly from a, a, what was a newspaper now, you know, online digital perspective, 
writers tended to be a byline that nobody knew who they were. They were just, they were, they were facts. And the social media changed that. And it made us people behind the facts. And that is where Twitter comes in. And, and if you, I want to do that because you, you have to want, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't, I never liked the idea of just, just being a person who report. I, I like, if you don't bring your personality and, and some sort of entertainment value into it, it's, it's un, it's boring for us and it's boring for them. And, and I just have, there's no real tolerance for that. So I, I think the ability to, to be a person and, and and not just be some sort of dead byline is one of the coolest things about it. And I'm not gonna lie, I mean, I feel like I test out story leads on Twitter all the time during a game or something like that where I'll say something, and if it gets a lot of good response, I'm like, oh, I'm using that in the story for sure. You know, or what, it, it's, a, it's a great testing ground for a number of things you can use in anything that you're writing or whatever, but mainly just to create personality and not just be, you know, the, the writer, you know, that just was a, was a name byline where no one would ever even know who, me from anybody from that chair well for me there, there's obviously want to because I wanted to get into talk radio and talk radio is about you know this is going to sound egotistical but it's about the host and it's about the host's opinions and the host has to sell himself and the host has to be passionate about what he says and so I wanted to get into that business from from the time I was I was a kid and part of being a talk show host on the radio in 2015 is Twitter, is social media. And so th there's an, obviously there's a, a built-in want to, but yeah, there's, there's a have to to it. I mean, you know, for me, it's, it's sort of three-dimensional. Number one, my job is to bring attention to myself. I mean, I, I don't make any bones about that. And, you know, I'm not a writer. I'm not a, a reporter. I'm not a journalist like Paul is. And I'm obviously not uh, selling a, a product the, the way Jamie does. I'm clearly not a talented athlete who's trying to build a brand like uh, Kevin is. And um, so it, for me, I'm just trying to bring attention to myself. And if I bring attention to myself, maybe you're going to listen to the radio show. Um, I'm also in the audience engagement business. Uh, and that's, you know, as I said at the top, that, that's just not a three hour thing anymore. My job is to in, engage people. Now, I'm not as good as some at you write me, I'll write you back. Number one, I, I just really don't like anonymity. I just, I don't like that. I, I don't want, I, I like knowing who I'm talking to. I always say, like, I get emails. The best emails I get, usually at the bottom of it, have a guy's name and his job title and his phone number. The worst ones I get are like, you know, Musketeer Steve. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, at hotmail.com. So I'm not as good as, as others at, at going back and forth. And sometimes you just find yourself like debating people and it's like, oh, it's nine o'clock at night. I got stuff to do. So, um, but our jobs are to engage the audience. And then Twitter's a great way to bring you my product. You know, one thing we often do during our radio show is, hey, Kevin Huber comes on in four minutes to talk about his Pro Bowl experience. Here's where you can listen to it. Or, hey, coming up in one hour, you know, right before I got here, I tweeted out, hey, we have a pretty good guest list today. Here's who we have coming on. Here's the exact times. So it's, it's, a, it's a billboard in your hand. It's a billboard on your, your laptop where I can tell you, hey, here's what's coming up today. It's a commercial, you know. Radio stations don't buy commercials anymore. We don't buy billboards anymore for the most part because we, we shouldn't be do We don't need to. I can tell you at 10 o'clock today, hey man, at 4.04 today, we've got an interview with Hal Morris, who used to play for the Reds. You're gonna to wanna to hear that. Here's the link to listen to it. And so that is a vital aspect of, of what people like me do. And so there's, yeah, there's obviously, look, I'm, I, I like screwing around on Twitter and making jokes and you know, sometimes making people mad and hopefully sometimes making people laugh and usually not really saying anything of any importance. But there's a critical element to my job that cannot be ignored. Um, and I, you could say that about, I believe, any form of media, whether it's news, really whether it's play-by-play, -play, whether it's sports journalism, columnists, whatever, I've got to deliver my, there's so much content out there for you to find that anymore I've got to bring it to you. You know, I've, I've got to, hey, here's how you can hear me. Here's, here's what we're doing. And it's, sometimes people tell me that we go overboard with, but that's a good thing. That tells me we're doing our jobs. Um, it, you know, it, it's, I'm not selling tickets and I'm not selling, you know, stuff that you're going to pay money for, but I am trying to get you to take my product. If I write a blog, here's the link. Um, that stuff is vital. And if in the process 
I do things that bring attention to myself, that add followers. Ultimately, the design goal is to get you to click on our links, to get you to listen to our radio show. So it all kind of ties together. Kevin, you just on there for a laugh? Yeah, I don't really know why. I'm not very funny, so I <laughs> follow the funny people and just retweet what they say. You know, one of my favorite people to follow is Shooter McGavin. Um, you know, he was on <laughs> Happy Gilmore, but he's probably one of the funniest humans that I've ever followed. You know, between him and Pat McAfee, who was the punter for the Colts, you know, they tweet enough for everybody. So I just let them tweet, and I'll favorite them, or tweet, retweet them, and I'll go back and forth with them, and, you know, that's about the most fun I have. But I'm not very funny. I'm not creative. You know, last year when I got hurt, that was probably the most creative I've ever been. And I, and I got a bunch of followers for it. So I guess maybe if I tried harder, I'd probably have a lot of followers. But More blender pictures. Yeah, yeah, I need to get hit more, I guess. Um, but, yeah, I mean, back at the Pro Bowl, I had a little back and forth with Pat McAfee because our drink of choice was strawberry margaritas. And this man can drink a lot of strawberry margaritas. So we'd put pictures back and forth, and it was, you know, any time of the day, be like, just try and be like Pat, strawberry margs, and just take pictures of it. And, you know, I probably got, just for something stupid like that, I probably got, you know, a thousand followers just because he has, you know, half a million followers. And, you know, it's just, I just let everybody else be funny. I just kind of tag along with him. We got a couple minutes left. Uh, let's recap what we've learned today. Kevin just wants to have a good laugh. Mo loves himself and wants people to love him. <laughs> Paul's happy to put a personality to his byline, and well, Jamie's just a tough guy. <laughs> so um, let's look. First thing you do in the morning, you roll over, you wake up, your alarm goes off, your cell phone's sitting right there in your nightstand. I know, I know where I'm going. What are you looking at? Social media, your text messages. What's the very first thing, Mo, you're looking at? Twitter? <laughs> is this, is you want to know the first is thing I do in the morning? <laughs> you really want to know that? I mean, I've roomed with you enough times. <laughs> True. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, you get caught up in the last six, seven, eight hours? Yeah, what, what you know, it, it used to be the first thing you would do if you, if you hosted a sports talk radio show is you grab the newspaper, you turn on Sports Center. What did I miss? What's, and and you, I still do those things. Uh, but yeah, the first thing I look at is my phone, and you know, the first thing is obviously just see if, what emails I may have gotten or whatever. But you know, it's it's Twitter's a great gauge of what people are talking about, but there's a limitation to that. You know, sometimes my producer will say to me like, "Wow, you know, Twitter's blowing up," and I'll go. So like one person tweeted something. Like she'll say, she said to me the other day about this whole Matt Latos, Joey Votto thing, which I'm sure, you know, Jamie's tired of hearing about. She's like, well, somebody on Facebook said this. And I go, so we're going to devote a three-hour radio show <laughs> that hopefully reaches thousands of people because of what one person on Facebook said. Uh, I get into this with my, my colleague, Lance McAllister, who's even more into Twitter than I am. He does a, a show with us as well. And he'll allow one tweet to dictate, like, a whole one-hour show. And, and I, like, I... It, it, far be it for me to tell him how to do his job because he's better at it than I am. But like I, I, I've said to him on the air, like, well, will you let one person dictate what you know. Don't let the one person's opinion make you think that that's how everybody feels. So, but yeah, it's a it's a great way to just get caught up on what's happening. And uh, it's one of the first things I do in the morning is just see what's out there. And but not just in the morning, throughout the course of the day. You know, there are times where, you know, because of meetings or other obligations or whatever that you know, we'll sit down to kind of map out what we're gonna do that day and I'll feel like I'm out of touch. And so you'll kind of just scroll through really a few hours worth of stuff happening on Twitter just to see, all right, what's, what are people into today? What are people really talking about? And you know, there are times where at the very last minute, um, a couple of weeks ago, right before we went on the air, Marty Brenneman said something on 700 WLW that I did not hear. And I wouldn't have been aware of it if a lot of people hadn't been tweeting about it. And we made that decision about five minutes before we went on. All right, let's talk about this because this really feels like it, it matters to a lot of people right now. So it's not just the first uh, first thing in the morning thing. It's it's really kind of an all day thing. Uh, hey, what's you know what are people in uh, upset about? What are people laughing about? You know what are people really excited about? And and so you know I, I would imagine that's pretty consistent across uh, across everybody who does jobs like the one I have. Paul. Well, half the time uh, I will get up and just look at it through my fingers and hope that somebody didn't break some news that I should have had or something <laughs> like that, you know, or what, you know, what a player did or what pro football talk said or something else that I'm going to have to follow that day. I mean, it, it, you, that's absolutely. I mean, you're you're in a constant state because 
there's so much, and, and even if someone writes something that's speculation, it's something that if every all, if all Bengals fans are talking about something that was right about some Yahoo, literal Yahoo employee wrote about you know five players the Bengals need to sign, and it catches all it has everyone in Bengals talking. Well, may, you might have to react to that, and that is a constant state in our business of having to follow if other people are doing. And we we create a lot of it, but since there's so many people out there now, there's constantly stuff that you have to be ready to react to at a moment's notice on top of regular uh, news breaking. One, one thing I just wanted to say, I think that's really important on Twitter and any social media really is to be yourself because if you, like Kevin was joking about how he's not real funny or, you know, it, or if you're, if you're really good at being serious and analytical then maybe you, you need to be that on Twitter and not try to be funny. And if you're good at being funny and maybe, you know, you're not good at under, you know, knowing the deep end of stats and stuff like that, you should probably stick to, because that's the way you get in trouble because people stuff gets misconstrued all the time whether it's uh the lack of a sarcasm font that's really necessary yes or any number of things i mean just if you're out of your comfort zone it is obvious on twitter i, I on social media in particular and so that's the i think it's the biggest thing that i find when people are doing things that it just doesn't work is when they're just clearly not being themselves and I, that's that's really to me that's always the key to handling twitter if you're trying to do something you're not then it's obvious Here's the only thing you shouldn't do on Twitter. <laughs> Don't ask a famous person to retweet it because it's your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> or for a follow. What's that? Or to follow you. Or follow me. Yeah. It's worse. Yeah. There's just those, really, those are the only two things you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. If you, if you want to retweet because you were born. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how to follow that one. Um, but for you, you can't turn off your ringer at night. No, it's, especially if I'm traveling with a team. If I'm the PR representative for the Reds while on, on the road, I have to. And, you know, there was an incident uh, two years ago in Pittsburgh, uh, and this happened all in the same day, where Todd Frazier saved a man's life, giving him the Heimlich maneuver, which was, yes, thank you. But somebody broke into Aroldis Chapman's hotel room and tied this stripper up with tissues or something that – and this all happened in one day, and I'm like the only PR guy there. So, I, you know, that's an example of I can't turn it off. Um, but normally it's I wake up, make sure there isn't any negative things being talked about on Twitter that is reprehensible to our brand and to our, uh, my company, um, and just see what's, you know, the scuttlebutt as far as what the Reds are, uh, are, what the Reds are concerned with. So it's, it's something that I, I keep an eye on. Kevin, obviously you don't have to keep an eye on it, but you, you admitted that you do. I mean, how often are you checking in? Oh, it's surely out of boredom. I just, it's like a... Specialists don't have, have a lot of extra time. It's on like hands. a nervous habit. I have just, I wake up in the morning, I look at Twitter, look at Instagram. You know, I, I got off Facebook just because I only went on Facebook to see pictures. And now Instagram just does. I can weed through all the ads and get all that out of the way and I just stick with pictures. So that's why I do Instagram and I'm off Facebook and... Uh, so my morning routine is Twitter, Instagram, and then my email. Go through spam, see if there's any good deals on golf balls or something for that day, and, and then I get up and get a coffee and go on with my day. Obviously, uh, emails the least of anybody's <laughs> concern and checking in there. Uh, obviously, some great information today. Uh, I know maybe one or two of you had a question before we wrap up, or you can grab us afterwards, but any other questions that, that you want to put out there before we wrap this up? You can tweet us as well. Mo will certainly reply unless it has to do with microwave pancakes. <laughs> huh? Uh, yeah. Well, no, we're not. I'm sorry. I was just seeing if my name was spelled right up there. <laughs> so it's misspelled. It has an S at the end of Eggers and an E at the end Wouldn't of Wouldn't surprise me. All right. Uh, well, we certainly appreciate you all coming out and, and asking some good questions and, and participating today. I think we have some great personalities who do different things on social media, especially on Twitter, and uh, we'll continue to do that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for setting up, Jeremy. And uh, Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Yep, thank you. All right.